Hello, everybody, and welcome back to day two of 28 days to master level chess tactics. I'm also calling it 28 days to level up your chess tactics because we are going to the next level in this iteration of 28 days to better chess tactics, basically, covering very hard positions. And I really want to show in this video how much you can learn from one very deep position. And I would say, you know, even if you're not at a 2000 or above level, you can still solve very complicated tactics if you go slow and you train the most important thing, which is your thought process. Now, we are covering kind of 10 themes in the next 28 days, but it's not necessarily to learn themes. I'm trying to teach that finding forcing moves with a thought process that you can apply throughout an entire game will lead to many wins because even if you don't know a pattern, just looking for forcing moves will lead from your calculations to the correct solution. So let's get into this position. It's white to move. And it looks like black has just captured here. And if you wanna pause the video now would be the time to do that. I want you to keep in mind to first apply the thought process. I'm gonna put a four step thought process that you should apply. Now basically you'll evaluate the material first, then you go towards the position, which is mainly the activity. You'll notice, I guess what Jeremy Silliman would call imbalances, which would be to your advantage on a certain part of the board. Uh, then you'll try to look for forcing moves, which is checks, captures, and threats, and then a blunder check after you decide on your move. All right, so let's get into it. So in this position, we're going to start with the material aspect. And it's actually quite an interesting position because the material is incredibly equal. Two bishops, two rooks, a knight, and the queen, and even the pawn structure is similar with this kind of structure on each side an isolated pawn, and then these here. So determining that, you have to move on to position to correctly evaluate this position. And you notice that I'm going from general to specific. I'm noticing the major factors in the position, which you could actually do on your opponent's time. You just sit there and you say, okay, that. And then when your opponent makes a move, what you wanna ask is, what's the purpose of his move and what are his threats? And I'm not saying that you react to them right away, but you just notice them and keep them in mind. So you'll see that obviously black just captured a pawn. He has a threat on this pawn. And notice that he has a pretty active light square bishop, but also his queen is over here, not very active on the queen side. And the rooks here look a little discoordinated. And then step two would be noticing our position, our activity. You'll see that white has this knight over here, uh, but the knight can easily return to the center at some point. But what you really notice is these very active bishops. And also white has uh, basically control of the semi-open file here on the F file and on the D file. So from noticing these elements, you'll then go to forcing variations. You'll just start looking at candidate moves and you'll try to narrow it down. So you wanna look at attacking moves, checks, captures, and threats, and you'll immediately notice that the queen could checkmate if this knight wasn't here. And this is where kind of you can learn basic tactics within a very complicated tactical position. And I do find that solving these kind of complicated tactics makes it much easier to play a game because if you can solve tactics like this, then you know a two or three move combination is nothing if your opponent makes a mistake. And now this is a game between Kramnik as white and Lok Van Whaley. So obviously these are super grandmasters, um, but all right, let's just keep going. So other than noticing this check, you see that you can't do that, but uh, let's look at more forcing variations. There's obviously Bishop takes and Rook takes trying to eliminate that Knight and maybe something like H4. So obviously you can discount h4 because, you know, the bishop could just take with check. Uh, let's make that move. So if you see, uh, all right, well, I guess I'd have to play h4, bishop check. Man, just the king would have to move. And I guess black is a little more active. Yeah, so, I mean, he could just take the pawn too. So you could just discount that move. Uh, it's just a not a very good move. All right, so... You, are, you mainly want to look at bishop takes and then rook takes. So these are the two logical choices trying to eliminate the defender. 
And you can see that if rook takes, uh, obviously the bishop takes, and either a bishop takes or rook takes, for example, rook takes, bishop, it can't take because then it leaves the checkmate in one. All right, so the, the only move from bishop or rook takes is pawn takes. So you'd want to try to do that with check. So let's look at rook takes and then bishop takes. All right, so you're noticing these main factors in your calculations, bishop takes, and then check. And now there's basically only one move, because if the king moves, then you just take the rook, and you're up a piece with a very open black king to attack. So if the rook goes over, you can see that we get a check. And after the king goes over, we get another check. So this is really where your calculation should end because you see that for a minor piece, you've also won three pawns. Now the black rook and the bishop are a little more active, but you still have the initiative with the checks and your pieces are about to get very active. Now obviously you can close the bishop with e4. Uh, you wouldn't really want to play something like g3 because that actually creates more dark square weaknesses for black to attack. And you could also sack on g3, something like that. So keep in mind those positional considerations and your opponent's options, your opponent's forcing options um, in any line you calculate. All right, so that's actually what happened in the game. And let's just try to go for another uh, possible variation. So if you looked at bishop to d4, that is an attacking option, um, but it's not very forcing. And, it, and it's kind of not in the spirit of the position uh, because basically white has more activity and almost a one move mate threat on the king side. And so that should lend you to the forcing options of breaking down your opponent's defenses. And that's why we're studying annihilation of defense first because that's a very logical way to play is always looking on how to break down your opponent's defenses, especially if you have the initiative. So, I mean, bishop to d4, it does win. Uh, if he moves the rook, then you still have the attack, and actually he's black's a little less active. Um, but you should also see e5, which is an exchange sacrifice. And you do win an exchange, um, so it would be about plus two. But notice from your evaluation in this position that white is a little less active. Um, he doesn't have the dark square bishop. He gave the bishop pair to black. And he still has the initiative and some attack, but it's not as powerful um, as the starting position. So you can also improve your uh, positional understanding with these kind of tactics puzzles. All right, so let's go back here. So let's finish out the rest of this game. So obviously with bishop takes and takes here, it's not as forcing because you take the rook and then he has more options. When you're calculating a forcing line, you always want to try to force as many checks as you can. And if you're going to end up giving away the rook, then obviously you want to end with bishop check and a potential mate. You know, I mean, if the rook came in, which she would never do that. Um, but basically just reduce the options in your calculations. All right, so I would suggest that you start at the beginning of this and you visualize this forcing line uh, with the ending of queen takes e6 check right here. So this is where you can stop your evaluation in your calculations. And once it's on the board, then you can start to figure out what to do. All right, so let's just continue. Basically, the puzzle's over at this point, but I'm going to use the rest of the game to kind of illustrate um, how you'd find forcing moves. And you notice that pattern recognition kind of breaks down at a certain point because you basically just have to do the hard work of looking at every forcing move. And, you know, pattern recognition helps in calculations, but it doesn't help that much when you're calculating kind of long lines. I would say it's more important to get the first one to three, maybe four moves correctly and accurately than it is to be able to calculate long lines. And the evaluation is really the hard part. All right, so he just keeps checking. Now the main threat for white is he wants to play bishop to c4, but of course the rook could just sack and then for example, if he just played bishop to c4 right away, the rook would take. And then after takes, then black gets this really bad uh, check on g2. So white's trying to prevent that with e4. And this is another important point. When you've won material, you want to start thinking about how to clamp down on your opponent's counterplay. 
now your opponent can get a lot of counterplay after you kind of open the position. And so you want to close down lines and files to your opponent. And that's what Kramnik's doing here. All right, so Black's just trying to chase that knight, but actually it just helps him get active. Uh, the reason he played that was so he could play b5, preventing uh, bishop to c4. But White just continues with his attack. And there is a lot of moves in this position because it's quite open. And White is just getting more and more active. So Kramnik chose a rather simple way with knight to f7. Of course, the rook could take, but then white would just be up three pawns with a more active position and a continuing attack against the king. And then he goes for knight to g5. And after queen, he just goes for the simple fork, winning back material. And actually, he still continues his attack. Um, he must have calculated further. So I'm just, I'm trying to say that you know, even a super grandmaster, he probably, if he's honest, probably did not sit there and calculate all the way to the end of this position. He was probably able to calculate and evaluate that queen to e6, queen takes e6 check, has won enough material, and he can stop black's counterplay, and that should be the end of your, your practical calculations. All right, so let's just finish this game out. He goes there. And then Kramnik just plays e5, obviously opening the line to his bishop. And this is the point that uh, Black resigned, actually. So the game was over. But you can see that the final evaluation of the position is very bad for Black. I mean, White is could just take a rook. Uh, there's a lot of potential moves, and he's probably going to be mated soon. And it's an, an evaluation by the computer of plus 17. So many moves. Uh, and I would say if you want to calculate you know, final position, you could... You could play back to here and then just calculate here. But effectively, from e5, the game was over, and it doesn't really matter at this point. White has such an advantage, uh, then you can make a lot of forcing moves. Just bring the rook into the game, uh, maybe even play something like bishop to f5. All right, so I know this position is quite complicated, and that's what we're doing here. I'm trying to show you, though, how many basic tactics come into play, uh, like from the beginning with queen takes or queen to h7. You can see that there's a lot of basic tactics within a complicated calculation. Now, I would say that if you got any variations wrong, I'm going to set it up to the beginning of this uh, position and just calculate the variations that you do know. So rook takes, and now here's the original position. So now that you know a little bit more about this position, now would be the time to calculate and go through any deep variations. And I'm going to see you in day three, and we'll go from basic, intermediate, and we'll do one more advanced position to close out Annihilation of Defense. Thanks for following along, and I'll see you in the future. Don't fret if you got the solution wrong. Another time you can hear my lonesome song. Maybe when you hear for a while.